My name is Linda Hype, and I'm with Homework Building Supplies. I'm going to kick off the afternoon session here um, and then let these guys continue uh, so you can bear with me for a few minutes. And I'm probably going to stand still so I don't trip over my cord here. Um, my discussion or my portion of the discussion is really on the flashing. So Tim kind of started off um, at the end of the last session talking about the weather resistive barrier and all those details. And as you guys know, all the devil is in the details when we're talking about this kind of stuff. And really, you know, the number one litigation in the building industry is still moisture related. So, you know, in, in my meetings with builders, I still hear that, you know, windows and doors are the leakiest, uh, you know, little trouble spots on the home and on the vertical wall. So, you know, from my chair, I, I see a really a, a, a better job with, you know, what Tim was talking about with, you know, making sure that we're wrapping all the gables and all exposed sheathing is wrapped and we're, you know, proper shingle fashion um, and we're doing a lot of that. And I see great uh, improvement in that over the last couple of years. So now when we move into the window and the door area and these tricky places where water, you know, Water's going to find the path of least resistance, you guys. There's a path it's going to get in, right? We can't, con you know, we, we, it, it's just going to happen. So it's all around controlling moisture and stopping it. Um, you know, also providing uh, paths for the moisture to get out if it does happen to get in. So that's kind of the purpose for a lot of this, and, you know, and continuous improvement over the years. So I'm going to step through my little portion of the proper way to... Um, detail a window, so the opening, how to cut the opening, and then a little bit about the proper sequencing of the flashing. So we're going to start, and these are some pretty um, generic slides, um, but you know, you got your house wrap on the wall, we, we find our window opening, and basically you guys, you know, years and years ago it was the X cut, right? We've really transformed, I mean, all the window manufacturers are on board with the new I cut, and we're going to step through that, but you know, when we used to make the X and the Tyvek and bring all four sides in, like Tim and Tom alluded to earlier, that, the, that provided the WRB or the Tyvek to just be a funnel for water to run right into the window opening. So that's a lot of the reason for the cuts that we're making today. And really the proper terminology is a modified eye cut, you guys might hear that, or a true eye cut is really the, the verbiage that we're using for this cut. Um, and then the other part of it is that we are exposing the WRB or the Tyvek at the head of the window or door. So basically what we want to see is you make a cut flush across the top of the window, you come straight down the center, and then you make a cut right at the bottom of the window. So it's all done on the outside. So you're, now you're wrapping the two sides in, but at the head and the uh, bottom, you, they're cut flush. That's the reason for the eye cut. Then we take our, our knife and we make about, maybe about a six inch cut on a 45 degree angle on each corner of the, of the head of the window and we release the Tyvek. So that's really our first preparation there. And then step two, basically in our research, DuPont's research, and I think a lot of window manufacturers would agree, where's the, where's the place that always has the, the most rot and damage? when a window is concerned. When you come back 10, 15 years later and the guys that replace windows, you, got, you are the guys that really see it. Uh, We're, the, so, the corners, right, at the sill. So that's the reason, you know, Tim brought up the product that DuPont happen, happens to have, DuPont Flex Wrap. It's a three-dimensional flashing, but it's called a pan flash or, you know, flashing the sill in one piece because that's really where we see the damage 10, 15, 20 years later when we come and re, re, replace windows. The water's going to get, if water does get in, where is it going to sit? It's going to sit at the sill and it's going to rot that out. So we're going to protect the sill, we're going to flash the sill, preferably in one piece to protect that. Um, and then step, the other thing then is then we're going to set the window to the window manufacturer's installation instructions. And the whole premise, Tim brought this up, to leave the bottom open. Because if water does get in, we want it to be able to get out. And we want it to be able to get out to daylight and not come into the structure. So that's uh, part of that as well. So we follow our window manufacturer's installation instructions. DuPont happens to recommend that we back caulk all three sides. Again, like Tim mentioned, we leave the bottom open. Why? Pretty obvious, right? To allow for drainage, right? We want the water to be able to get out to the outside. That's the reason. I know you guys all know this stuff. This is pretty basic 101 stuff right now, but um, you know, that's what we're here to talk about today, making sure these details are done right. 
that when I measure the jam flashing, I add six inches. So the window's four feet, I add six inches because I want to go three inches above and three inches below so that we're really protecting those corners. Get the jam flashing installed. Then when you cut the headpiece, you do the same thing. The window's three feet wide, we add six inches. Again, we want to go three inches over the jam flashing on each side of the window. So we take the headpiece and we flash over the window flange to the sheathing on the wall. And then the last step is you bring the that Tyvek that you had stapled or just nailed out of the way, you bring it down. Now there's two layers of protection at the head of the window. Again, like I said before, when we were doing that X cut and bringing the Tyvek in, it was just a funnel for water to right, run, right, run right into the window opening. Now we have two layers of protection at the head. And then we have to tape those cuts off, take our trusty Tyvek tape and tape, tape those cuts off. And um, actually, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I go back, um, you know, again, I kind of f flew through that pretty fast, but I'm, I'm seeing this done. The picture that you guys saw of the, the sill that Tim showed with the flex rep in the corner and then a straight piece on the sill, that, we're calling that a modified sill uh, method for certified installers only. So anyone, I know I, a lot of familiar faces in this room, I think I've trained a few of your crews and stuff, but if you want to become a DuPont Tyvek certified installer, you're then um, able to do that modified sill. The other method is that you run a straight piece of flex wrap on the bottom of the sill to completely protect that wood opening. Now you guys, again, everything on the vertical wall, everything around the window, proper shingle fashion. And I'm not the genius that invented this, but this was the four D's of moisture management, and this is really what we follow. Um, I stole this from Mark Liberté, or one of those building scientists out there. But I, and actually, it says the four D's of moisture management. I actually think it should be the five D's, and I think the first D should be design. Has anybody ever seen a poorly designed structure where maybe a roof-to-wall intersection leads right into the window of a first floor, you know, and dumping all the water right, right into the window opening? Stuff like that. We should actually kind of start at square one and start designing buildings to be more moisture friendly. <laughs> You know, thinking about those details, because again, like I said, the devil is in the details. You can have the best products in the world, but if they're not installed properly, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So let's start, number one, with good design. Number two is deflection. And I always use the roof analogy. This is pretty basic stuff, you guys, but would we ever reverse shingle anything on our roof? I mean, even some guys laugh and say, well, you know, maybe the new guy. Well, you know, we teach the new guy proper shingle on a roof to keep the water out. We should be thinking of the vertical wall as a roof. Everything on that vertical wall in proper shingle fashion, the same way that we do a roof, including the windows, the doors, all the penetrations, everything that we've been talking about up to this point. So again, um, think of the vertical wall as a roof, deflect the water away. Third is drainage. Again, we want to provide a path for the water to be able to get out. The fourth component is drying. Are our walls going to get wet in our climate? We live in Wisconsin, right? We get pretty much get it all here. We get hot, humid summers, cold, dry winters. We get a lot of rain and wind and snow. I mean, we get it all, you guys. Our buildings are going to get wet. How able are they able to dry? And that's the whole key is um, using materials that are actually, you know, that promote drying. And then last but not least, durability. Maybe you might want to know the products that you're using. What are they made out of? Do they have asphalt in them? Are they butyl-based? What, what is uh, these products that you're putting on your, on your windows and you know, hoping that they, they don't leak over time? You know, what are these products made out of? Do they have a warranty? And is the company that um, you know, is manufacturing these products, are they going to stand behind the product? So just some things to think about when we're talking about that whole moisture management and um, the way to flash a window. Um, and then I guess just one thing, you know, this may be where I end, but um, you know, really just kind of making sure, again, of that proper shingle effect and that flashings need to be lapped. And I think this is kind of where someone else takes over. But is there any other question, or are there any questions? Th I have three more? Okay. It, and I know we saw this picture earlier, but again, you guys, that is not correct. That's a, that's a reverse shingle right there. So the Tyvek, you know, should be cut and brought over um, at that intersection again so it doesn't become a funnel for water to run right behind there. You know, another tip that I always say is who's the last person to see the condition of the Tyvek or your WRB? The cider. 
I, what I do is I would recommend that I give, you give your cider a roll of two-inch Tyvek tape because he or she is the last one to see the condition of the Tyvek before the siding goes on. There's a rip or a tear or something's not detailed right. You know, maybe as a company, that's something that you guys need to sit in a room together or out on the job site and discuss, but who's responsible for those details? Well, in my opinion, it's pretty easy because the last person that sees the condition of it should be the one that's responsible for repairing it. But, you know, that's just me. So um, just something for you guys to think about there, though. Um, this is my last one. So, the, uh, so again, it's just the same thing. This is a reverse shingle. Um, you know, the Tyvek should be over there, again, to prevent water from getting in and causing damage. Um, like Tim said, maybe it'll show up in the house and we can, you know, find it early, but a lot of times we don't. Um, so those are some things. I have a lot. Of, I brought some information with me, you guys. DuPont has some new guidelines available. Um, they just updated all their guidelines. They're actually on Tyvek.com. Everything residential, commercial, um, flashing details, all of this kind of stuff. I'm going to be here to the end of the class today. Is there anything that I didn't uh, mention or that I forgot to mention in my sequence of slides? I know I flew through that quick. I guess one last thing, you guys, a lot of guys might you know, sometimes say to me, well, Linda, if I do that X cut, or I mean, if I do the I cut and the windows aren't delivered for three weeks, you know, that's a chance for the Tyvek to blow. So, you know, it is okay to do the X cut the day the windows come, you know, make sure that we're doing the proper cuts, make sure that we're doing the eye cut, and we're getting all of those details right. You know, I understand we don't want the Tyvek blowing, and, you know, a lot of times if we make that cut at the head, that can happen. So, again, you know, you can do, do what you need to do until the day those windows arrive um, and you're installing windows, then everything needs to be done proper. Any questions for me? Otherwise, um, I will be here to the end if you guys uh, want to see me afterwards. Thanks. I'll remove my papers. I'll let you go with your cord. Linda does a fabulous job sending siders, uh, you know, your framers, um, and you can get Tyvek certified as your own individual company. So Linda's a great resource uh, with Hallmark for, for those, uh, those details, as well as application. Going to talk a little bit about flashing on porches and decks and uh, stay, uh, attached to the wall or the floor assembly of wood frame construction. You know, whether or resistant very properly cut and shingle over flashing uh, the, the deck ledger board almost properly flashed, uh, tape, taping this, the, uh, the cut and uh, uh, no kick out. Uh, uh, Flashing there as well. Just an example of uh, and just a, a little bit on the uh, on the corrosion of fasteners um, for pressure treated wood. Uh, the uh, the treated wood industry uh, really recommends. Uh, only stainless steel or thick coated hot dip galvanized fasteners or connectors be used for uh, lumber treated with uh, non borate uh, preservatives. So, stainless steel or thick coated hot dip galvanized fasteners for pressure treated lumber. And again, uh, you know the the, uh, the flashing uh, the wall the uh, this is uh, for those that are in the back the flashing tape underneath the barrier coming down here <coughs> taping the uh, cut uh, lapping the barrier two inches uh, over the uh, flashing and flashing the uh, uh, coming coming out as well and then having the kick out flashing right there as well proper method. Going with the where the gutters go before, that's that detail um, with that kick out flashing so it doesn't dive behind the wall board or behind the siding. That's a better example of it. And then this is just a uh, 
An additional flashing reference that, uh, you know, that the, and Linda touched on this uh, continuously at the top of all exterior door and window openings, extending horizontally past the frame, at least an eighth inch on each side, uh, under and at the ends of masonry, wood, or metal copings and sills, and then uh, built in gutters. Anyway, uh, with weatherization, um, our next topic is getting into kind of siding, masonry, your exterior fenestration. Um, it's basically your cladding. It's your aesthetic piece on the outside of your walls. And it's your, it is your first line of defense, but as we talked about with weather-resistant barriers, very important to make sure that you've got a tight uh, wall system before you start putting on your brick or your siding uh, to ensure that, you know, if you do get moisture behind there, you can kick it out. So the types of cladding materials, signing uh, vinyls, probably still pretty predominant in the marketplace, but obviously wood, uh, cementitious products like fiber cement, brick, stone, and EFIS. So, you know, just the importance of, of, of weather-resistant barriers. Um, you know, even though we've got a one-inch air gap behind the brick and we think that water is going to, you know, flow right off of the OSB, we've got a lot of different uh, things going on here. We've got bulk moisture that can get in behind there in addition to the moisture that can be driven in by the sun pushing moisture through the brick and to the back side. Don't rely on OSB as your, as your moisture uh, barrier and saving grace. You need to have something like a product like Tyvek behind there. So here's a kind of a lot of things going on right here. Um, we've got our cultured stone down below, vinyl siding up above. You can kind of see there's some uh, drip cap flashing over this one by board and then uh, kind of meshing into our, our return wall where the Tyvek is. Very important to understand this is right from the Vinyl Siding Institute. Vinyl siding, uh, just a couple pull out sections here, is designed as an exterior cladding. It's not a weather resistant barrier. It's designed to allow the material underneath it to breathe and therefore it's not a watertight covering. Again, you guys go behind a house after a rain, or behind a vinyl siding after a, a rain shower, and I guarantee you'll see moisture there. And that's one of the reasons why they put weep holes in, in vinyl siding for it to drain. To achieve the proper uh, design performance, vinyl siding must be installed over a weather resistant barrier, system that includes that continuous weather resistant material and the properly integrated flashings to kick the moisture back out. Yes, sir? <coughs> Prior to the house wraps, Tyvek, pipe power, whatever it was, what were they supposed to put it, what were they supposed to put behind the vinyl siding? Because I have a customer whose windows are rotting out from the inside because there's nothing other than the, like the asphalt impregnated board that was on the outside. That's it. There wasn't a requirement at the time, at least from our state code's point of view. Okay, but then from the manufacturer, it says that this was designed as a, a, an exterior cladding, not a not a barrier. So when they developed this, what was their recommendation or was there not anything at that time? You know, that's a great question. I, I, I don't know if I really have a, a good answer for you um, besides what's here. I'm sorry? Fill paper prior to Now, now what does a homeowner do that, you know, what was that? It said prior to 1980, all, all wood exposed was had it felt? Covered. Had it with, with a felt? Yeah, with felt. Yeah. 15 pound felt. Okay. And even today, the felt paper should be used behind main masonry. Yes. Well, yeah, some, you need a weather resistant. You need some kind of weather resistant barrier behind really every product, and that's the that's the code today. Um, I'm sorry. It shouldn't be stapled on. No, it should have some cap nails. Um, so, again, just the importance here, and another great point. You know, without a good weather resistant barrier, you're subject to a lot of nasty things that can go on behind that wall system. Um, here's another example using Tyvek and, uh, and uh, vinyl siding. Um, again, vinyl siding just basically hangs uh, on the house. And, you know, we've been using Tyvek for, well, I've been using Tyvek, gosh, ever since I've been building homes. Um, and there's a lot of great applications for Tyvek, obviously. You know, the first initial one was an air barrier. Um, is how Tyvek was used, and then there was a lot of uh, discovery about how great of a, a weather-resistant barrier it was and how it could shed water. 
And uh, to some extent, I guess people took that literally. Um, so this was a, a photo that I saw when I was out in Washington, D.C., and there's somebody that's got confidence in the, in the Tyvek product. So, you know, we talk about flashings. We talk about the importance of weather-resistant barriers. When you get into complicated, you know, elevation details like this, there are so many opportunities to screw up flashing. So it's so critical that you make sure that you look at everything before you put that siding on that house. Again, that house should be 99.9% .9 weather tight before you put that exterior fenestration on. Here's kind of an example of getting a valley away from a corner. Here's uh, kind of what we were talking about with the chimneys before, making sure that you kick that out. Um, but again, you know, back to what, uh, what Linda was talking about, how important design is. You're still going to have clients that want that gingerbread look on the outside. And if you can't get around trying to minimize the amount of penetrations or the angles like that, you better make sure that you've got a really tight building envelope before you roof it and before you side it. Another example here with cultured stone um, with a drip cap. This is over an overhead door area, a drip cap behind here. You know, cultured stone is uh, a, a number of building scientists have claimed a uh, cultured stone really is our next EFIS challenge. Um, there's not a lot of drainage behind it. There's, there's, there, there are products available now, and, and we use one that allows for kind of an air gap behind that. So it's, it's called drywall. And we put that right in between our stone and between our mesh and, and our weather-resistant barrier. There's still a weather-resistant barrier behind that, but we've got to create a channel to get water that does get in there to get out so it doesn't just sit behind there. Because this is kind of like also referred to as lick and stick, so to speak, I've heard people say. And it does stick on the side of your home. It's not, a, it's not a true masonry product on a foundation. Cultured stone is fastened to the home. It's important to make sure that that breathes and that it can drain. Yes, sir? I was at a meeting a couple weeks ago with building inspectors, and they had said that that, uh, that stucco stuff, that they've been having more and more complaints and problems with it, um, with, with the, with the uh, giving moisture problems underneath that stone, actually had fallen off the house. And they also had said, that the guys were talking about, that they couldn't find anything wrong with the installation. It was installed the way that it was supposed to be installed, but yet it still failed. Right. So have you guys heard anything more about that? Or maybe that would be a question for Linda with the, with the materials. Has anybody heard about that? Or is that really becoming a big problem? And it said it seemed to be mainly on gable ends where they were having a problem with it. So, so I mean, you can you check everything you're supposed to. You know, you sometimes you get, you get moisture behind that, maybe like in a fall rainstorm or something like that, and the next couple of days it freezes. Uh, and I've seen, you know, you drive by in a community, you'll see a piece of stone that popped off. Um, if, if you're not getting that moisture, if it's not allowed to dry to the outside, you know, you may have a good strong barrier inside that's not going to get inside, but if it can't get out, it stays there. And then over time, it either freezes and pops it off, or it finds, its, uh, finds some penetration in, into getting into the home. Well, but this detail is, is, is very important for those of you that use cultured stone. I think actually makes the material that's supposed to be exactly for that stuff, that stuff around. It's supposed to be corrugated. It's supposed to do that stuff. And that stuff was on these jobs, and it still didn't, it still failed. Part of the issue, too, is our code. You know, the UDC says one layer, to, no matter what kind of cladding it is. But most of the rest of the country follows the IRC, and that requires two layers behind anything that's uh, direct mortar applied to the wall. So in other parts of the country, they're using two, a two-layer system behind cultured stone. And that's what Tim is kind of alluding to. He's got the Tyvek, but then he's got this drainage mat in front of it that will actually create a, a space for the water to be able to get out. And that's really the key right there. It's just that our code doesn't follow it. What? A two-layer drainage system? Well, it's a layer of Tyvek with a layer of the drainage mat product or the dry mat or whatever oh, it's dry, called. Drywall, D-R-I. And there's other ones wall. out there. And there's other products out there, yeah. Basically, you're looking for a rain screen, guys. Mm -hmm. you, you, need to, you need to come off of that weather-resistant barrier with some kind of channel to drive moisture down. And then, of course, you have to have an egress on the bottom to make sure that you get it out. And, and the old way of doing it, and even a lot of the manufacturers still today, don't really have that, that rain screen. I think you're going to see a heck of a lot more of it because I know that there's already... Um, you know, the, the litigators have gotten a hold of this in a couple markets, particularly the very wet markets in our country, and they're all over it right now. So, so those will change and catch up, but 
at this point, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done and a lot of knowledge that needs to be shared with people so they understand how to properly prepare for this type of product. Yes, sir? Make a mistake. Get the mason of my spill paper on top of the Tyvek. Then he dresses the Tyvek underneath the flashing, or the flashing over the Tyvek. That's the way for the water to come out. But, you, but if you're uptight against something and you don't have a capillary break... You know the stucco Tyvek, which is wrinkled? Right. And the moisture to come down. Ideally, but, but when you start putting mastic on that, you know, and, and you start putting mortar into those spots with the screen, you know, it, like Linda said, the double layer system is a better fail safe system. Oh, no. oh using two layers of Tyvek? No, 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 one layer of Tyvek, one layer of belt paper. Oh, okay, oh, I'm sorry, I understand. And that is how it's worded in the IRC, the International Residential Code. So I think what Tim is saying is that we're even learning above and beyond that, that, you know, a space. We, we use the International Mason, Masonry Institute requires a one-inch space behind brick, but we're not requiring the stone manufacturers aren't requiring a space behind this product, but maybe that's where we're, we're headed. Where I come from, that's the, that's the rule. Yeah. We have to have a capital. Well, I thought I'd heard that if, if, if the, the cement's actually attached to the tie-back, the tie fails, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. the, that was a rumor. You mean the lime in the cement causes the breakdown? Yeah. That's just the best rule of thumb. See, I think that what you're talking about is that I think that I don't know if they changed it, but when Tyvek first came out, there actually it really wasn't waterproof. You know, no. your, your brain would drive into it and it would run off of it. But if you put a piece of Tyvek over a coffee can full of water and put it out in the sun, you would see the water come right through the Tyvek. So that yeah. might be what, what, you know, driving into that stuff or something. Maybe that's what I, I don't know if yeah. that's changing. It, it, yeah. it, it has progressed from an air barrier only to an air and water barrier. You know, and that, that time frame happened in, you know, the late 80s, early 90s. You know, that's really when that transition uh, happened. So... You know, there's just a lot out there, you guys, you know, with our code versus the other code that most of the rest of the country follows, and then also the manufacturer's recommendations as well. Those are all things that we have to take a look at as an industry and come up with the best solution. And sometimes those conflict. Yep. So, you know, to set yourself up with, a, with somebody, a building science, or go to the, you know, the MBA building science seminars, I mean, you'll, you'll learn a lot, and you'll see a lot of scary pictures that a lot of these consultants have ripped apart houses and it's just crazy how much mold and uh, furry walls you see from things that are improperly flashed. All right, back to you, Tom. Thank you, Tim. We're going to continue with our focus on safety as far as scaffolding is concerned. Uh, we want to make sure that we place scaffolding on uh, the legs on firm footings, that we use base plates and mud sills. We fully plank a, sa uh, a scaffold to provide a full work platform or uh, use manufactured decking. We want to install tow boards, especially for objects that could fall below. Guard scaffold platforms uh, that are more than 10 feet off the ground with the guardrails. And we want to provide safe access. Ladder safety, again, uh, provide, uh, place ladder, ladders at a uh, at a proper angle, one foot out from the base for every four feet of vertical rise. Extend at least three feet above the landing. And ladders secured at the base or at the top to prevent movement. Protecting workers from falls. If a, walk, if a worker on a ladder or a pull jack can fall more than 10 feet, uh, protect them by guardrails or personal fall arrest systems. So when we're looking at weatherization, roofing, cladding, and such, your typical time frame for roofing is about two to five days, depending on the size of your roof and then what you have your roofer doing for you in your scope of work. The exterior cladding, another four to ten days, again, all 
related to size. We'll do our roofing and our, and our uh, wall flashing, roof felt and roof ventilation first, and then usually our exterior cladding, drainage plane requirements, and, and the cladding installation comes right after that. Draw process, um, how we get paid, um, very important. A lot of changes in, in the lending uh, industry since, you know, in the last five years, we keep coming across uh, new requirements by individual lenders uh, in our draw process. But your basics are, you're, you have a, you, you know, in your application for payment, you have a breakdown basically of the work that you've done and the cost associated with that breakdown and the request that you're asking for in your first draw, second draw, how many draws you do with, with your, with uh, the bank that your client uses. You have to provide uh, your current lien waivers and they got to be original copies. I don't know of any um, lender at this time that takes a, a photocopied uh, lien waiver anymore. And you have a contractor affidavit saying basically that you did the work in good workmanlike manner and you're paying your contractors. A little different whether it's a cash deal or if it's a bank finance deal. Um, if it's a cash deal, um, those don't come by that frequently a lot, but we just had one recently. We work with our client to make sure that we set up a separate escrow account, that he funds the escrow account ahead of when we're going to request our draw, and we have that in part of our agreement. Um, with bank finance projects, those are a little bit more easier to manage because the bank already earmarked the money for uh, their client, so it's just sitting, sitting there waiting for us to apply, apply the proper paperwork and request for for payment. But when, when you're dealing with a cash buyer, uh, want to make sure that, that that buyer is funding, you know, you do set up an escrow account through a title company and they're funding the amount of the draw well in advance of when you're going to need it. Owner approval is always required uh, depending on how your contract reads, um, whether it's a complete list sign off or you're just at a stage of construction, whatever it may be, the owner has to sign off before the bank will release the funds. We'll also have a title inspection, uh, company inspection. They'll come out and approval, make sure that basically what your agreement is with your client for draws is what happened or what's done out on the site. And then once they get the owner's approval, um, they'll sign off. And then, of course, check handling, them bringing you the money. So lien waivers, um, there's, there's a statute, uh, 77903, that you can take a look at in the administrative code looking at they must be written, they must be signed by an authorized agent of the organization that is giving you the lien waiver, uh, cannot be contractually waived. Uh, trained contractors cannot have their rights waived for uh, leaning on a property. Presumed full, uh, the lien waiver is presumed to be full and complete unless it's specified as a partial lien waiver. So like for your mechanical contractors, plumbing, HVAC, electric, they always have two trips they make to the house. So that is a great example of a, of a partial lien waiver uh, release that they may give you. Any ambiguity will be presumed against the party signing and uh, does not waive all other remedies that the, uh, your client may have or that your trade contractors may have. So uh, moving into rough mechanicals, uh, it's typically about a two to three week time period again, size of house determinant. Municipal inspections, uh, about two days. Doesn't mean that it takes two days to do it, but once you contact them, they typically have 48 hours to get out there, or two business days to get out there to look at it. So we're, you know, HVAC will typically come first in the house just because it's a lot bigger product that's going in. Plumbers can usually wrap around it. Electricians can get around it. Your plumbing would come next. They're probably the, the, the middle rigid in terms of the rigidity of their, of their, of their product and where they can go and then electrical will come last due to the flexibility of their installations. And we typically do a rough walkthrough with our client too as well, not only just to make sure that you, you got everything that they uh, assume that they're buying, but also to make sure that you get an opportunity to kind of showcase your work and what's behind the walls. You know, home buyers, homeowners, most people don't see what we see uh, on a regular basis and sometimes we take that for granted. I'd uh, encourage you to share your work that's behind the walls with your clients. Um, all the HV supplies and returns are installed within that interior and exterior wall system. All the fan duct work, this is all before drywall. So uh, here's kind of a, a, a look at uh, a system install in a basement. We have uh, here with the insulation already in the house, this is a, a supply duct work for a, a floor above and then 
This uh, vertical piece with a horizontal section would be for like a microwave or a range vent being direct vented to the outside. Water supplies and drains, we talked about that, all your showers and tub modules. It's a lot easier to get a shower and tub module and frame than it is after drywall. So here we have some pictures of some of our plumbing. Here's a laundry room uh, where we have our rough-in drains and then we have our supplies. On the electrical side, service panels typically installed here, but you can also get your service panel. We typically try to get our service panel installed as quick as possible so we can have power out at the site uh, for everybody so we don't have to run generators all the time. Um, they'll be pulling all the wires and the outlets and the switch box. Um, and then I think this is the section of safety, Tom, that you pop, you bop, you pop in. Safety expert. Just a, uh, just a couple things on uh, electrical hazards and the focus on safety as far as electric is concerned. Um, all electrical wiring installations, equipment, and materials used in construction of dwellings shall comply with the requirements, obviously, of the Wisconsin Administrative Electrical Code. Uh, builders should make sure that their subcontractors have an assured grounding program. Uh, potential safety issues, uh, missing ground pins, um, inadequate insulation on cords, potential exposure to live electrical wires or missing lights. So an uncovered service box. Again, the, uh, the electrical uh, missing light, an open uh, electrical hazard there. Avoid as much you know, avoid where possible and don't do those things. Employees could be uh, exposed to the live wires and the hot taps require personal protective equipment. Electrical panel boxes need to be covered. Back to you. So we're looking next at insulation and drywall. Um, you know, insulation, there's a lot of different products out, and it, it seems to be growing as a market. Uh, you know, whether it's the traditional fiberglass bats, um, still craft-faced uh, bat insulations out there, but you're also getting other products like loose cellulose, uh, blowing in a uh, blanket system called bibs. Uh, they even got denim uh, now, more greener insulation, if you will, especially for people that have um, uh, respiratory conditions or alert allergies to like formaldehyde, there's a lot more greater alternative uh, insulation products out there that people can now use. All insulation is defined by R value and basically what R value means is by definition it's the resistance to heat transfer. So the higher the R value means the greater uh, pushback if you will that the insulation is going to give to heat crossing uh, its surfaces and, and through, its, through the insulation itself. The higher the R value, then that the greater the resistance to that heat transfer. Uh, sound bats, if you're going to do sound bat insulation, your client wants it, you need to decide that up front uh, with the client. It, obviously, it doesn't eliminate sound. I've actually found better luck with uh, double layers of drywall than I've done with uh, sound bats. That typically does, it, does a pretty good job. Gypsum material is your drywall, that's sandwich, that's basically the gypsum, gypsum material that's sandwiched between two uh, sheets of paper. Your traditional types are half inch and five eighths, but the drywall industry um, is now coming out with a new product that's uh, called half inch fiber reinforced drywall. And that is intended uh, to supplement or to eventually eliminate the need for the five eighths. Typically, outside, let me back up one second, the 5 eighths is still going to be required for fire code. But in areas where you have trusses, typically if you put a half inch up on a ceiling, you know, you may experience some bellying because the material is so thin. So what the industry has done is they've come out with a fiber reinforced, kind of like what the concrete industry has done. They've come out with a fiber reinforced drywall so now that you can use half inch in your, in your attic trusses and in, in, uh, in your storage areas and especially for ranches. The gypsum, U.S. Gypsum Corp says it takes 15 percent of gypsum material out of the board by going with the half inch fiber reinforced and, and 
drywall in general, gypsum, is a high energy intensive uh, manufacturing process. So in addition to the weight of transferring that product across the roads and on the rail lines, they also can use less product and still accomplish the same goal. Other products like green board versus regular drywall, I, I'm not a big proponent of green board. Um, I typically go at least behind tile, that is. I'll use it in other areas of the bathroom, but behind tile, cement backer board is, is tr traditionally your best product and the best way to go. So typically about process and insulation, two to three days plus the inspections. Drywall, a little longer, two to three weeks. Um, depends on the moisture level in the home. Uh, you know, during the spring and the fall, your dry times might be a little bit better. Summer, when it's very humid, dry times will take longer. Winter times, depends on what you use for your uh, temporary heat situation, but you might find a lot of moisture uh, in the winter time with drywall as well. One of the things that sometimes people forget um, when you are doing taping in, in the winter time, you know, make sure that you open up some windows uh, to allow that moisture out because coupled with the amount of water that's in drywall, drywall mud specifically, and the drying, if you leave your windows closed, uh, you're going to get an extreme amount of condensation on your windows. And if you see it on the windows, I guarantee you it's other places in the home that you can't see, probably in your attic as well. And if, for those of you that have had raining attics, um, when you're in the drywall phase, you, you'll know what I mean. Uh, insulation begins after rough framing and mechanicals are already been inspected. Key, make sure all that stuff is inspected before you insulate. Um, when I was building homes in Franklin, I went in one day to pick up a, a building permit and another builder's uh, superintendent came in all frazzled and he says, John, he says, John Skura, for those of you guys that might know him in Franklin, John, I, I, you know, I insulated the house. I didn't know that you didn't have the electrical inspection. What part of the insulation can I take out so you could take a look and make sure that everything's fine? John's response, all of it. So make sure you get your inspections done before you move. Uh, vapor barriers installed on the warm side of the house because we are a heating climate. Uh, moisture moves from the inside to the outside, so we don't want it to get in our walls. If the ceiling in is, uh, insulation is to be blowing in, we usually want, you'll do this after the drywall is installed. And in the winter time, it's critical that you have that up there uh, to try to keep the drywall from freezing uh, with the outside temperatures that's in the attic, that is. And insulation is, is critical. Um, you know, insulation should look like a fluffy pillow. Uh, you don't want to compress it. When you compress it, you reduce the R value. It should be nice and set in the cavity. That way you can ensure that you've got a, a better quality uh, product. Here's kind of that pillow effect. Here's a, some bad insulation in an exposure wall condition in a basement. Uh, here's a, what they call blowing in bibs insulation. Um, we use this up in our, any of what we call Gula space, garage under living area, Gula. I learned that a few months ago. Uh, but this is, this space we use, uh, we're using a, um, a, a bibs product. And we tend, especially with eye joists, we get much better consolidation uh, in our floor system. And we actually increase our R value by almost 30%. We can get an R40 out of uh, the, the, that space than you can with a traditional R30 bat. A little bit more expensive, but uh, it's hard to put a price on comfort. Another product that uh, is, is um, well, it's not new on the market, but it's used, being used more frequently, so it might be new to some of you, is we use a closed cell foam product up in box sills. Now, closed cell foam is, is very, very expensive, um, but used strategically, it has a tremendous return on the investment for the dollars that you spend. This area right here in the basement box sill, you have a tremendous amount of penetrations. Also, it's very difficult to get any type of vapor barrier uh, like, you, like you have down here in that, in that area. So by using that closed cell foam, you not only get a well-insulated cavity, but you get an airtight, for the most part, you get an airtight cavity. Uh, so the process of drywall, load the house, hang the drywall, tape the drywall. For those of you, um, if drywall is loaded in the house and it's in your way, don't move it. <laughs> Have somebody else come in and move it for you. Um, I was with a guy, one of my buddies, and this was years and years ago. He's a superintendent. He tried moving some drywall with a plumber because it was in the way, and the sheets fell over on him. He broke his leg. You're dealing with a lot of heavy product there. Don't move drywall on your own. 
So here's a before tape. You can see we've got all our, our drywall sheets up. We've got our corner bead molding on the corners, so we've got some impact resistance there. Much more durable corner. And then we go into uh, our taping process. And again, here's where a lot of moisture uh, comes out of the house through the drywall taping process as well as the paint process. So make sure that you're properly ventilated when you're taping the house. We talked a little bit about this before as far as uh, protecting workers from falls, uh, especially in the drywall stage, uh, uh, that guardrail, moving that guardrail up to the height of the stilt uh, and uh, taking care of that and, uh, and also uh, not removing the guardrails to accommodate the trades. And then uh, focusing on safety from an uh, insulation standpoint, uh, you know, the personal protective uh, equipment, PPEs, uh, the respirator, uh, disposable coveralls, the cotton gloves, and of course the safety goggles. And this is uh, just, a, you know, we always maintain a safe and clean working space. Continue. Continuing on here with the, uh, the finished paint and trim carpentry. Uh, definitions are, uh, are up there for the paint prime. Uh, Self-explanatory uh, uh, primer applied to the drywall to seal the porous surfaces. Finished paint, uh, last coat applied to the uh, walls and ceilings. Typically will be a base coat due to incremental shrinkage during the first year. Trim carpentry, the setting of cabinets, the hanging of doors, installing the trim, the base, the casing, chair rail, etc., crown, countertops, setting the countertops after the cabinets are set and prior to the finished plumbing. Finished paint and trim carpentry as far as the process, uh, time frame, uh, painting, uh, Typically one day to paint, one day to dry, trim carpentry, anywhere from one to three weeks. Depends on the complexity of the job. Process in building, um, paint prime done immediately after the drywall taping. In drying, trim carpentry begins after the paint prime. Finished paint could be done between paint prime and trim carpentry with touch-ups done at the end of the process. And a walk through the sign-off on the paint and stain colors. And any uh, look in the, and also to determine if there's any damage to any of the products. Just some pictures of the uh, setting the cabinetry. Hanging the doors. Mechanicals. All right, finished mechanicals. Um, at this point, we're going to complete all of that rough mechanical stuff we talked about, the heating and ventilation, air conditioning, plumbing, and electrical. So we've got our furnace and our air conditioner, uh, the basement trunk lines, vent covers and registers, uh, finished plumbing, all the supply pipes we test out. Well, we tested out in, in rough plumbing, but we're also going to test out again at this point. Uh, clients don't like water where it's not supposed to be. Install water heater, install faucets, toilets, uh, appliances, anything that's part of your scope of work. And then finish electric is uh, switching plates as well as hanging your light fixtures. Finish, uh, the finished mechanicals are typically in total about a week and you usually have some overlap a uh, few days with the HVAC, uh, a little longer with plumbing depending on what you got installed at rough frame and then your electrical finish follows. So it's the same order again. It's the HVAC in first, then the plumber, then the electrician. Um, you know, the plumber typically has some product installs that the electrician has to wire. Obviously, same thing with the furnace. So all of that equipment really needs to be there before the electrician can finish their job. So here, there's a lot of products um, you could find. You know, Google's a great thing. 
If you look up flashing products for wall penetrations, you'll get a number of these that show up. And we talked about these before. Linda hit it really well uh, on the window flashing. Um, we talked about the roof flashing. You know, we all know about the big holes that we need to hit, but it's a lot of the little things that can get us in trouble too. Um, light boxes on the outside, you know, for your coach lights and your fixtures, your switches, your, out or excuse me, not switches, but your outlets outside. Um, you know, whether it's in a framed condition or if it's in a, a masonry condition, there's gas pipes. You've got all of these things coming out of that one box sill area. You got to make sure that those are flashed properly. If you rely on your client to caulk them, at some point in time, I guarantee it's going to fail. Try to stay away from, from caulk as your sole source of, of uh, flashing and, and removing water from the house. So here you can see, especially in a stucco uh, condition or an EFIS condition, um, all those penetrations can create some challenges for you if not sealed properly. On the mechanic side, here's our finished uh, HVAC system. Uh, we've got our water heater, our furnace, and then uh, here's an air-to-air -air HEPA filtration system. Especially if you're building really tight houses, if you're if you're testing your house with a blower door and you work with a consultant, if you determine that your house is too tight, you got to introduce some mechanical ventilation to help balance. So again, some more HVAC. This is all basement work. Um, just good practice is, is, is taping seams or any of your uh, connections that you have in the HVAC. Um, you, you want that supply air to get to the space, you want the conditioned air to get to the space that it's going. There's so much duct leakage uh, in, in older homes where a lot of that, you can't cool the second floor, but I tell you, that basement's sure cold in the summertime. You know, you can't heat the basement, but that second floor is sure hot in the summertime. It's all that leakage that we have. You know, we wouldn't buy a, a car with a, with a seam in the gas tank that drips gas as we drive down the highway. Why would we allow our conditioned air that we pay for to not get to the destination that we want it to go, go to? It's not code required, just a good building practice. Um, I like hanging air conditioners off of the foundation rather than putting it on a, on a pad. I've just seen a number of uh, settlement conditions that this really provides a much more stable environment for the AC unit. Um, and, and contrary to some belief, uh, there's no vibration on the house. There's nice little vibration isolation pads underneath there. Talk a little bit about radon. I'm not going to read the, uh, the complete definition, but uh, radon actually comes from a uh, natural breakdown of uranium in soil rock and gets into the air that you breathe. Uh, the EPA, uh, for those of you that uh, uh, you can go to the epa.gov and uh, you'll find a very nice citizen's guide to radon. Uh, it's got all of the uh, facts that, uh, uh, that you need to know about radon. Uh, the uh, radon resistant uh, as far as uh, the radon mitigation, uh, really uh, may vary for different foundations and site requirements. If your new house is built or will be built with, to be radon resistant, it will include these basic elements, which is a gas permeable labor, layer, excuse me, uh, usually four inches of gravel under the foundation. Plastic sheeting over that gas permeable layer Sealing and caulking all openings in the foundation floor. A vent pipe, usually a three to four inch pipe, runs from the gas permeable layer through the house out the roof. And a junction box in the lower level for a potential future fan. Um, it'll, it'll be located in the attic. If it's a retrofit, it's typically, if you can't get through the attic or through the garage, it's, it's on the outside. Well, a 
houses get tighter and tighter. Um, you know, when I lived in Shorewood, I had no concern of right out of my house. It, everything went out. <laughs> Candles would blow on a windy day. Um, but as we're building tighter and tighter houses, we're keeping everything in. It's great for heating and cooling. It's horrible for our health. So we have to make sure that we use exhaust fans in our bathrooms and our showers and when we're cooking. And like I said, if you know, we, we do blower door tests on every one of our houses. And if you don't know how tight your house is, I, I'd like you to consider that. And you can determine if you're tight enough to start looking at these types of systems. But um, talking to our radon installer, uh, you know, his business over the years has, you know, and he's been in it for over 10 years, Every year, it, gets, it seems to get more and more relative to the number of uh, real estate transactions or even new homes because everything's getting tighter and tighter. It's, it's not becoming a, a greater problem because there's more radon. It's becoming a greater problem because houses don't leak as much. Well, there is a, there's a naturally occurring strip that goes from like Delafield up through the falls because my ex-wife and I have to sell our house like in Burton. <clears throat> There's a huge, it runs right through there. Anybody that's ever sold a house in the area had to put in a system. I mean, we had some of the highest ratings in one of the areas when we did it. Also, it is a little test you open up. Simple test. Yeah. Simple test. And you, and you can go on the epa.gov, and you can actually see the zones. It's split out by counties uh, for all the states and obviously for Wisconsin. And as you move off of Lake Michigan, you know, the tendency is, is that, you know, you have greater concentrations of, of radon. However, one cannot go by exclusively what your neighbor, you know, you might test your house and your house might be really high. You go right next door and test your neighbor's house and they got nothing. Um, so, so there really isn't a, a good predictor besides testing. But, you know, Waukesha County probably has the higher rate of, of radon system installs probably than most other, other counties. Jefferson County has a big uh, uh, radon problem challenge as well. <clears throat> Just to, uh, this gets into the uh, finished flooring and a description of uh, each of the uh, materials, uh, vinyl flooring, uh, wood flooring, ceramic tile, and carpet. Um, Vinyl flooring, sheet goods, uh, you know, the wood flooring can be solid wood or engineered, pre-finished or unfinished on the, and stained on the job. Ceramic tile, most still a clay product, but porcelain products perform better. Pattern goes all the way through the section of the piece. Carpet, again, uh, nylons are found in, uh, uh, in most cases, be the best wearing, toughest fiber. Process time and finished flooring, uh, vinyl flooring anywhere from two to three days, wood flooring anywhere from three to ten, depending upon whether it's uh, stained on a job or pre-finished. Ceramic tile, two to five days, and carpet usually one to three. And then as far as uh, installation, uh, on the vinyl flooring could be done before or after trim carpentry. Need before plumbing finish. A quarter inch underlayment is installed first. It's allowed to acclimate to the house. Seam filler and all the seams of the underlayment. Vinyl flooring then laid over the underlayment uh, can be perimeter glued or full spread. Wood flooring, raw boards, typically installed before trim carpentry and then sanded or finished after finished mechanicals. Pre-finished, typically installed after finished mechanicals. Ceramic tile can be installed before or after trim carpentry. Three-eighths to a half-inch cement board installed under, as underlayment. Tile must be set before grout can be worked in. Carpet should be one of the last pieces installed in the building process. 
carpet tack strips installed around the perimeter to hold the carpet edges and the carpet pad uh, stapled to the subfloor. Picture of the finished carpeting. Vinyl flooring. Wood flooring. And again, with uh, the focus on safety, uh, especially with the wood floors, with the dust, uh, with the respirator. Installing tile floors, uh, trying to avoid dry cutting. The ceramic tile and the tile board, and uh, make sure uh, when you're, uh, you're wet cutting that tile that you're wearing safety glasses. All right, so what is substantial completion versus final completion? Um, just two quick definitions for you. Substantial completion is when the, it's basically sufficiently complete for the owner to occupy uh, the house, and, and obviously you can get an occupancy permit. You probably still maybe have some exterior paint touch-up, depending on the time of year that you close the home, but if you can get occupancy and... and uh, Basically, you have enough uh, sufficient work complete for the owner to live in the home. By the, w, or by the MBA contract, that's uh, substantial completion, and you should be able to, outside of escrow items, collect your final draw. Final completion is a time in which all the work is complete. Your payment acts as a waiver um, for, for uh, all claims, except for those involving lien claims or claims of noncompliant work, or claims arising out of the warranty process. Final cleaning, most builders perform this service. Um, it's relatively cost effective. I, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, a lot of nowadays, so many product changes have happened that you, one cleaner that you could use on one product a few years ago, you can no longer use on a similar product today. And typically, your cleaners are going to, your professional cleaners are going to know that. There's a lot of dust and glues, so, you know, leaving all that for your client to kind of inhale and ingest. Um, is, is usually not a good way to end, you know, a great building experience. The cleaners are also better prepared for cleaning, and they know what products you can use and what you can't use. So if you don't do a pre-closing walkthrough, I'd encourage you to do it. The key here is not only just to walk through the house and identify, you know, paint touch-ups or anything, what I call nick, scratched, gouged, cut, you know, that's not covered under the warranty. Um, but you also want to orient your customer to the house. You know, make them aware of where all the shutoffs are for plumbing, uh, electric circuit breakers. Uh, a lot of people uh, haven't lived in, in a new home or at least a home under the current code requirements that we have. And you want to make sure that you, you, you orient them to it and educate them. And it'll save you a lot on phone calls and warranty claims later. Um, I always tell clients to ask questions. It's very important that they feel that they have an opportunity to speak and uh, make sure that they don't feel shy or they don't feel that you want to hear them. Please encourage open dialogue. Builders punch list. Most builders should perform their own punch list prior to the customer re review. It's a proactive approach. Remember, first impressions are everything. Um, and then you want to get a sign off from the customer. You should have some kind of form that you use that you get the client to sign off that you're tracking. List items, the client agrees to these items. When you complete the items, the client signs off on these items. You file it away so they don't come back later and say, oh, what about that? Or this, this over here was damaged, you never fixed it. Well, you know, it wasn't on our original list. And then you decide how you want to approach the situation. Closing process, all paperwork clearly explained and understood. I mean, if you're dealing with a turnkey client, you know, you, there is a formal closing process. Um, otherwise, you're really just you're gra you're you're going in for your your last draw, and then your lender does more of a formal uh, closing process from construction loan to end loan. New home versus the builder uh, office. Uh, evaluate and test drive the home. Um, again, back to that pre-closing orientation. Sign off on paperwork, and again, gives yourself another opportunity to to resell your company. 
uh, keep those product warranties. You know, a lot of your warranties, especially for bigger pieces of equipment, you know, like a furnace or even like a jacuzzi tub, you know, especially jacuzzi tubs, those all come in the rough frame and then there's this packet of, of papers and warranty and care and use manuals. You know, when you see that, grab that out of there and, and, and put it in your folder for the home because over time what's going to happen is everybody and their brother is going to step on it. It might get wet if you're, you know, you don't have your roof sheathing, or excuse me, your roof shingles on. You know, it's important to make sure that you grab the, those warranties as uh, your, your installers are putting products in your home. Um, product literature, specifications, warranties, very important to share that with your, with your client and make sure that um, they understand how to take care of the products. Again, minimize the amount of work that you need to do to educate your client in, during the warranty period if you do it up front. Warranty program, the MBA uh, industry standards manual. For those of you that are not familiar with it, I believe I saw a copy out front, but you can also get them at the MBA. We uh, give one to all of our clients. Uh, there's also the MBA written warranty. Um, a lot of the MBA contracts have been years and years and years of our attorney members reviewing them and things that have uh, come up in recent uh, you know, with change in products and such and challenges that we've had with, with manufacturers, these are always being updated. You've got a great opportunity here as an MBA member to capitalize on a lot of great information without a lot of uh, cost. Formal process for every customer uh, with a warranty. You know, if you, uh, we have a 60-day warranty form, an 11-month form. I'd encourage you to get as formal as, pro as possible. Obviously, there's going to be emergencies that come up. You address those right away. But the traditional stuff like drywall pops and things like that, uh, you want to make sure that you have a form so the customer can fill it out. And again, you can get them to sign off. I always say a warranty is only as good as the company that's backing it. And I think this is another opportunity here to, to reassure your client that uh, now that you've got paid, you're still in it for them to help them. So that's pretty much our, our Tom's and Mine's presentation along with Linda kind of helping out on the flashing side. Um, you know, basically our objectives, like we set out the get-go, was to have you think more critically about your operations, um, provide that results and the experience that the end customer desires, dedicate your company to safety, an ounce of prevention will save you a lot of money later, and then change orders, contracts, and, and, and sign-offs. Um, with that, we want to thank everybody for uh, spending your afternoon with us and uh, wish you the best of luck in 2012. Thanks again.